I have with me today uh, some elders uh, that I've known for so long in the Grace Communion International Church. And we want to talk about reconciliation today. And I'll have them introduce themselves and, and you know, your location and any other comments you'd like to make. Uh, start with you, Ted. Yeah. Ted Melhoff, pastor, Grace of God Fellowship, Tucson, Arizona. Lou Davies, assistant pastor, uh, Bellflower Long Beach Congregation. Jewel Love, Beaumont, California, uh, elder. Jim Roberts, <clears throat> retiring pastor of One in Christ Community Church in San Leandro, California. John Campbell, assistant pastor, Los Angeles, California. And I'm Stephen Brooks, associate pastor, GCI Los Angeles, California. Well, welcome, guys. Uh, it's so great to be with you today. It, you know, it, it just happens to be seven at this table. <laughs> you, know? you know, the number seven in the Bible is pretty significant, so I hope that this broadcast will be very significant, too. And I know it will because uh, we have an audience uh, that listens and are very interested in uh, reconciliation ministry. I'd just like to start off by asking you, what does the word reconciliation mean to you as we look at the Bible and, and some of the things we read about? topic. Anybody want to make a comment? Well, to me, reconciliation means the absence of conflict and the ability to communicate. Okay, great. Well, one way to look at it also is two people or groups uh, to become friendly again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I look at it the, the same way it uh, at some point in time, there was some kind of a conflict, and now that conflict has been resolved, and, and the two parties have come together. Okay, great. Yeah, that little RE is very significant. It <laughs> typically means a restoration or a return to something. And I think uh, to me, it's a restoration to a harmony that should have existed and is finally being restored. Okay. You mentioned the, the letters R-E that, uh, that gives us conciliation. Uh, I was asked one time, when have we ever been consiled? Uh, anybody like to comment on that? When were we ever consiled? Consiled. Before the fall in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I was, yeah. asked, I was asked that question. I was on the stage of the Ambassador Auditorium doing a workshop. and. And I was giving my very first workshop there, and I had this big audience, and people from the business community and from churches and all, pastors, and, and I, I opened the question. A.C. Green, a former Laker basketball player, was on the stage with me. And so somebody asked, when have we ever been consigned? You talk about reconciliation. And A.C. looked at me. <laughs> A.C., come on. And, and, and all of a sudden it popped in my head. I knew it was the Holy Spirit in the Garden of Eden. Right. And people said, yeah, that's right. So God rescues us too. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah, yes, you're right. It was in the Garden of Eden, and that's what Jesus came back to restore. That same relationship went before the fall of man and came to reestablish us. Okay, great. Um, who then is the author of reconciliation? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's right, that's, yeah. that's yeah. an easy question, right? Jesus Christ. And, and how did he become the author of reconciliation? At the cross. He made peace between made. the opposing parties at the cross. That's right, at the cross. At the, cross. the Father reconciled us to him through Jesus Christ. That's right. And it's amazing that it took the life of God yes. to reconcile us, of Jesus Christ, who is God, to reconcile us to the Father and to himself. And God would not have <laughs> sin in his kingdom. And he gave us a way that that sin could be erased forever. And that's one thing that brings up kind of an interesting question. Uh, do you find a number of people in, uh, that you meet, uh, church people, who have a struggle with believing that all their sins are done away? Do you find people who just yes. carry a weight around? Yes. yes. A lot of people expect that um, reconciliation salvation is plan B. 
Mm -hmm. God never had a plan B. Right. It was right. always plan A. Right. And they have a problem getting their, their heads around the fact that they were always loved and that they were always cherished by God. Right. That's right. Absolutely. It seems also, too, that um, those same people would have trouble believing Romans 8, 1, where there's no condemnation. Mm-hmm to those who are in Christ, that we have been reconciled to Christ, therefore in Christ we are not condemned when, right, you know, right. because of a reconciliation to God. That's right. And I found too that some people just seem to need to be down. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're not really happy until they get beaten you know, down and then, then they feel, okay, I'll help them pay this. this well, I think that what, what causes that is most people feel that that if you are doing something wrong, that there should be some kind of penalty for yes. it. So they don't believe that if they are doing things that are, are considered sin, that they shouldn't have to suffer for it some kind of way if other people are doing it. And so the fact that, that God has reconciled them, they just can't accept that without some kind of penalty being imposed on them. So that's how, yeah. how most, a lot of people feel like that. It's almost like uh, trying to help to earn us out there. Exactly. Right, right. Right. Yeah, which can't be done. I, uh, I call it the baggage car. <laughs> Give a couple sermons on that. Mm -hmm. And the baggage car at the end of the train. And I've had that happen to me. Okay, Lord, I'll give you 95% of my stuff. Mm -hmm. Help me out. But I'm going to keep that 5%. And we have a hard time getting mm -hmm. loose of that 5% to turn mm -hmm. everything over to him. Because mm -hmm. Jesus says, give them to me, tells us. Mm -hmm. right? Right. <laughs> well, how do, you, how do you deal with people, I know you have them in your congregations from time to time, who feel that they just have to help with this process. They just have to, they don't accept the fact that they've been totally forgiven. They, they, they drag it around. We talked about that a little bit, but just uh, how do you help to bring those people to the reality that their sins have been totally forgiven, and so they can they can just forget about the baggage? I think one thing that needs to be done in a case like that is to reinforce their minds and help them to understand the actual meaning of grace. That the, the grace is something that's given, and you do not have to do something to earn or to help the process along. Just understand that God has forgiven you and that your belief and your faith will take care of those things. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly, yes. You know, Another way that, uh -huh. um, that we can look at this is that people often have a Jesus plus syndrome. Mm -hmm. They can't just accept Jesus as he, as he is. They have to have Jesus plus ordinances and Jesus plus law and Jesus plus I've got to pay him back. Mm -hmm. And it's just Jesus. Mm -hmm. Got to go to the center of the center, which Jesus is. Right. And once, if you get through to them on that, yes. then they can grasp that Jesus has done it all. And it was like I said, Curtis, uh, we still hold on, or you know, who right. says you got a plus one? No, it's all about Jesus. He's done it all. Go forward and let go of what you have in your mind about that. Right, exactly. I uh, also run into people who have their uh, their checklist is like, this is what I have to do in overcome. How, how do we deal with this earning it uh, issue? That, that they just have, they, they have their list written down. And they, they have to do this, this, and this in order to, to please Christ and to be in a, a, a strong position in the kingdom of God forever. How, how do we, we deal with that? Well, we can share that, you know, how do you know that you've gotten to the bottom of your list? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, have you, yeah. when have you actually done enough? Mm -hmm. And who's going to decide that? Right. So, uh, you know, there'll always be a, a place that you've got to come to where you realize that there's no, there's not, no more steps to take here. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody has taken the final step for me. Right. Right. 
Right. I think uh, too, I know in my life, coming to understand the switch from legalism to grace, um, I think what God had to individually do through me through his Holy Spirit was to show me that it's okay you know it's, it's okay to embrace the grace it's almost like I have to allow I have to give myself permission or ask God to help me to have that permission to accept the grace because many times we might think well yeah you're telling me that I don't need a checklist but I don't really think that's right <laughs> you know I, I really think that I still need this checklist because that's how I please God no, you have to see it's okay to let go of the checklist because mm -hmm. it's okay to really understand the grace of God covers everything. It's not Jesus plus, it's Jesus is it. Yes. You just have to accept, you know, believe and go with that. Go in the freedom that believing in him provides you. Yes. In our congregation, we have a name for that list. We call it the doo-doo list. Enough said. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, like to, I like to emphasize again Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, mm -hmm. where we used to read that or it was given to us from the pulpit, and they would read, and God will provide the works for you to do, then get out there and start working. No. Mm -hmm. We just got through reading. God will provide the works for you to do at his time and his place. Right. And we need to follow him through Jesus. That's right. Now, let's, let's take uh, an example that's been in the news lately, and everybody in the world knows about it, the, the Ferguson situation. This is a, a reconciliation ministry. It has to do with reconciliation and race and all of that. Uh, how, does, how does Ferguson get this healing and this, this, this sense of grace and this sense of forgiveness and all of this, just uh, what, what do they need to do there? Uh, one of the things that it's going on in Ferguson, and I think this is when you're talking about a minority uh, uh, community, uh, the relationship that they have with the, with the authorities, the police and all that, it's something that's been, you know, festering for a long time, and it's going to take um, uh, both sides, and, uh, uh, especially the, the police side, to really uh, understand where they're coming from. I mean, when you when you see uh, uh, when you have a, a civil disturbance, I mean, not a civil disturbance, but a but a demonstration where they're they're picketing, and then the the, the police arrive with uh, military type weapons and things doesn't sit too well. Plus, this has been going on for years. I mean, the, pe the people are frustrated for, for years of things that they've encountered with the police. And so those things have to come out and the police have to realize that this is what, what's been going on. This is not something, this is just something that boiled over because of all the frustration that they had in the past. And so the, both sides have to get together and discuss all the things that have taken place and in my personal life, I, I know that that when you're dealing with policemen, especially as a minority, there are things that they do that will cause you to have a, a, a animosity against them. And so I can see that where those people be frustrated over the years. And then look at the makeup of the police department there. You know, there's 53 policemen and and uh, only three of them are minorities. And so that just it's it's one of those kind of situations where both sides have to get together, sit down, and go over all of the ramifications of both sides. Okay, great, great. Any other thoughts? Well, again, reconciliation is the absence of conflict. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be trust. Right. Before you can sit down and communicate, mm -hmm. there, there has to be an agenda that's set so that both sides will feel comfortable coming together. And without that in place, you're just going to have a frustrated group of people on both sides. Yeah. I think there's a very valid point as far as trust. I have never trusted the police going back to Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was born in Greensboro, Alabama in 1944. And, and I tell you, it was, uh, it was a police state. There was not a black officer around, number one, in, in those days. The civil rights movement had not reached its maturity. And uh, when I left there, I left there because of the racism, and I didn't have any, any rights, so I 
wanted to leave before I graduated from high school, but my folks wouldn't let me, so I went to New York to where I had relatives, but uh, after my graduation. But at that time, the same year I graduated, three students were being blocked from the University of Alabama going to college, three black students, by the governor. And they, they had to send down uh, agencies, uh, agents from uh, the White House to get them out of the way. And uh, so finally, uh, that happened, but I left, I left Birmingham, went from Greensboro to Birmingham, took a train 24 hours to Times Square, New York. And I said, well, I'm, I'm glad to be in a place where I'm sure there's not the racism. Boy, was I ever wrong. Yeah. What <laughs> year was it? <laughs> that was where you learned about it. Oh, yeah. It's you had all the yeah. neighborhoods. You had the, the Irish, and you had the Italians, you had the Germans. You had all the Europeans who had come, and they had been fighting each other, the, the Poles and all, in these neighborhoods in New York. They had their own neighborhoods, and then the black neighborhood. It's the Bedford-Stuyvesant, you know, all, all these places where the black neighborhood was. And, so what year was that, Curtis? That was 63. 63, that was before the main uh, civil rights movement even begun, right? Well, it was starting. It was starting. It was starting, it was starting, starting, starting about in, in, in 1960. But yeah, it was right. Started, okay. yeah, right. And, yeah. and then it okay. took the, the, the you know, through 660, uh, 68 when Martin Luther King was, was assassinated. Yeah, that's right. And it took his death to get anything really done because people began to empathize after that. And he was a preacher. Baptist preacher being gunned down you know, like a criminal, preaching peace. Yeah. You know, the, in the, you had the uh, this uh, Civil Rights Act, and you had the, the Rights Educational Rights Act in uh, 19, 1955, and you know, on the Civil Rights Act, and okay. later, and so so it, it uh, you had to get those the legislation through before anything could be enforced, and then even those the law people still didn't obey the law until uh, it took uh, the death of Martin Luther King and other people and marches and all kinds of things to, to bring you, it you, you speak about uh, the law in the government putting in these laws and people not willing to do that. And I think that one thing that needs to be understood or, or accepted is that their, their, their conceptions, attitudes, and judgments that are in the minds of people, regardless of who they are, what their ethnicity is, or anything like that. Right. And they need to realistically examine themselves, mm -hmm. see why they have these prejudices, why? why they have the attitudes they have, recognize that every individual is here because he's here because God has allowed him to be here or given him, him life. And we need to accept that, and that there's there's no no difference between us that matters. No real differences that matter. That we we need to think about, understand, and accept the law of love which God instituted, and the reconciliation would come through that, mm -hmm. and then, and people would accept each other as they are, and allow people to have their deal. That's right. That's right. And as I was talking about the mid fifties, the Brown versus Board of Education was 1954. Yeah, yeah, that too. And then we went on through the other acts. But it takes more than the acts of men, like you said, it takes an act of God. And and one thing that really uh, bothers me is the uh, Sunday morning is the most segregated time of, of the yeah. of week. Yeah. At, you know, in church when people mm -hmm. are at church and. Uh, why can't we as Christians set the example for the whole world? Yeah. And that's why we do what we do in this broadcast. We're trying to get people to come together no matter who we are. We've done a number of workshops in the Dallas area where the broadcast is done. To, uh, and we've had you know, people come from different fellowships and different ethnic groups to sit down and dialogue about these things. And We've made some progress, but there's a lot more to be made. Well, I have an answer to the question that you asked, Curtis. So what can be done, mm -hmm. it would really be nice if somehow the Office of Reconciliation Ministries could go over. Well, I appreciate uh, that. Over there. Yeah. That, would be a great, uh, would be a great opportunity because we certainly, God has blessed us, I mean, a team, with a lot of material. We've got a lot of material to give and, and we, it's all based on Jesus Christ in, in, in the Bible. And uh, But it just seems that some people don't want it or don't trust 
what you're going to say. Uh, people will use will, will ask me when I'm going to be doing a workshop. Well, I just hope you don't come in and demonize white people. Oh, I said that's not what I wouldn't even be in the ministry if I did that. <laughs> that's right. No, that wouldn't. That's not. That's not what I do. I, I go to scripture. I take. I give them what Jesus Christ has taught me. Along those lines, um, your your question was about what can be done with Ferguson and what. Um, what's just been mentioned earlier um, why can't the churches of the community get involved maybe okay like we mentioned Martin Luther King he was a preacher and so bringing in the scripture even if he didn't proclaim God 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 he certainly gave biblical principles as a preacher as a pastor um, and it was through him that we were able to institute a lot of the progress we made so right why can't the local churches in the Ferguson area, even if it's one church, will take a stand and say, we'll be a neutral ground for the town to come together. You know, maybe the pastor can be like the master of ceremonies or whatever, but he will maintain and have the policemen come and speak, or have citizens come and speak, or representative of the citizens come and speak, but maybe have a neutral ground for which the community can come to reconciliation. I mean, after all, God has given us Christians the mm -hmm. ministry and message of reconciliation, so why not the church be a grounds for that? Yes. Allow that forum to take place. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, and a great way to leave it. Thank you, Steve. Okay. <laughs> and I'd like to close by saying I want to thank you for listening to the program this week. Hopefully it's been of help to you.